Psalms 23, verse 3. There's one little phrase I want to get into. Psalms 23, verse 3. And most of you know the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And it's David who was a shepherd comparing uh, a shepherd taking care of sheep to how God has provided for him. And he comes up with one statement that I'm going to focus on. He says this, he restoreth my soul. He restoreth my soul. We could call this, he restoreth my soul. But I want to focus in on something that I believe is the number one issue with every single person sitting in this congregation. And I'm going to tell you what it is. It is called a soul wound. The reason that people have problems in their marriage is a lot of times because that they have a wound that has never been healed or that has never been addressed. The reason churches have difficulty sometimes with members is because those members have a wound from somewhere at a previous church or previous ministries and they never were healed and so they carry that into another congregation thinking things will be greater, things will be better. But then something happens that triggers. It could be a statement from the pastor. It could be a message. It could be contact with another person that doesn't have a good attitude. And there's something in the psychology called triggers. If you've ever been a, a veteran, they will tell you that if you have those dr bad dreams all the time and things, a hard time sleeping, that there are triggers that trigger certain things. You can come on an accident on the road and you see someone is injured and it takes you back to Vietnam or some of the other places that you have been. And if you've ever had what is called trauma in your your life. Trauma can be emotional trauma. It could be a physical breakdown. Not all breakdowns are nervous breakdowns. I've had a physical breakdown and it left my body to where I had no strength in it whatsoever. And it was all my fault. I'm not blaming on anybody else. It was my lifestyle, 16 hours a day, 17 hours a day, getting up at three in the morning to go into work because I couldn't sleep. And you do that for years and it's going to catch up with you. But here's what happens. I still to this day, after having gone through those things, can have a moment where I, I, I smell something. I think about something or someone says something and it takes me back to when I collapsed on the floor and it, it, you just do this all of a sudden you go uh, uh, you know and you can't hardly breathe anybody know what I'm talking about am I the only person oh good thank you I feel I really appreciate you folks to raise your hand because they won't think I'm crazy so anyway I want to tell you the background of Psalms 23. Psalms 23 is written by David when his father-in-law, who was King Saul, is chasing him in the wilderness trying to kill him. See, Saul wanted to be king, and then he wanted his son Jonathan to be king, and God had declared that was not going to happen. So he stripped the kingdom from Saul and anointed David at 17 years of age to take Saul's place. So Saul felt that as long as David was living, that that prophecy would be fulfilled if he could remove David. He would become the king, and then he could do what he wanted to do. Let me just tell you something. You better never go against what God wants because you will pay a very severe price. Don't make daddy mad. Come on, let's preach that message. Don't make, don't make daddy mad. And so David is being chased and he, he, he starts seeing a shepherd in a, in, in a field taking care of sheep. And that's when he realizes, wait a minute, he, the, God is taking care of me. Now, when you read these verses and you know what the verses are, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that was not a place where he was walking. That was what he was dealing with. He was dealing with the, the shadow of Saul chasing him and the possibility that if Saul got him, he could kill him. And then in Psalms 23 and verse 5, I love this. He said, but you're preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Saul has all these guys on horses trying to chase David. He said, you know what? Even though I'm being chased, I'm still in the wilderness. I've got provision. I've got water. I've got food. I've got 600 mighty men with me and God's taking care of me. So you'll know when you read the 23rd Psalms, that's the setting that David wrote it in. Now, David also, what I want to do is I want to talk for a moment about a wounded soul, a wounded soul. First of all, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 teaches that every person in this room, every person alive is a body and a soul and a spirit. Now, you know what your body is because you look at it in the mirror every morning, but there is a little bit of confusion or a people not understanding soul and spirit because the Bible uses the term soul consistently, and then it will talk about the 
spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 and 12 that the word of God separates the soul from the spirit. So let me give you the Hebrew definition of soul. It's a word called nephesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H. And I'm not going to spell it again. You can just write it down as, you, as it phonetically. But nephesh. Now, what is the nephesh? The nephesh, the soul, is connected to your will, your ability to choose yes or no, right or wrong. It is also connected to your emotions. There are There is an emotional aspect to the soul. And it is also linked with the five senses of hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touching. And, uh, and we don't have all the verses. It would take me about 20 minutes to give you all the verses to prove the soul is connected to those things. However, nephesh in Hebrew basically, uh, basically uh, translates as life force. Now watch this verse in Leviticus 17, 11. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You know what the Hebrew word life there is? It's nephesh. Nephesh. And the nephesh of the body is in the blood. So what keeps us living? What, keep, what gives us a life force? What keeps us alive? The answer is the blood in the human body. If you take the blood out of a human body, people bleed to death in accidents. Uh, my, my, I, have never, I never served in Vietnam because I was a kid, but my uncle did, and some of his friends bled to death in a war. It's a terrible thing. It's a very slow process of death. But if the blood leaves your body, then what happens? The life force exits your body because the life of the flesh is in the blood. However, there are other verses that indicate that nephesh not only is the life force of the blood for the, for the physical body, but it is connected to the spirit. And together, the soul and the spirit work as, as one. And someone says, well, okay, what's my spirit? Well, your spirit's invisible to you unless if you died, if you die, you will watch your spirit come out of your body and you'll look down and it will have the features that your body had. Anyone that's had a near-death experience, life after that experience will say, I came out of my body. I'm looking back at the, uh, the hospital. My body's laying there. The doctors are working on it. I'm looking at myself and I look like, I'm beginning to see that I look like that I'm a body in a body. That's exactly right. You are a body in a body. The spirit lives in the body. And uh, here's the good thing. And I, this is where the amen, the shout, the hallelujah, and, and uh, uh, you know, rubbing somebody's head uh, comes in handy. And that is this. I just want to tell you that uh, here's what's exciting, that when you die, according to a, uh, I don't have time to tell a story. I wish I had time to tell the story. But according to a true story, I know when a person dies, an angel of God will meet you at the gate of heaven and ask you how old you want to look. And everybody... Everybody just about that ever says, says, I saw my mother, I saw my dad, my grandparents will tell you they all look 30 years of age. Do you know why? Because that's probably the best you ever looked. Oh. <laughs> now, my wife says I started looking good in my 40s and 50s. Thank you, honey. I'll pay you later for that. But, but. Most people will say they look 30, 35 years of age. I'm t I listen, I have, I have studied hundreds of near-death experience, life after death experience, people that came back when the doctors revived them, and they all say the same thing. So the s first thing, somebody needs to say, oh, praise God, if I look that good, I'm going to give God a hand right now. So if you think you're going to look good in heaven, you're going to look better than you look now. Come on. All right, all right. The, and the second thing, now we all, I want you to understand something, and I've got to tell you this because this is just part of the humor of the message, is because the weight that we put on is weight on the flesh. It is not weight on the spirit. So guess what? When you come out of your body, you're going to look fine. That's another place you should shout and praise God. Yeah, hey, I'm going to look good. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. So these are just some funny things I want to t tell you. But here's what I want to say to you is the soul and spirit can carry wounds. And, and, and here's this is very important to hear this. Because the soul is connected to the mind, intellect, and will, what happens to the soul affects your spirit. And what happens to the soul, the wounds that happen in the soul, do something that Paul talked about defiles your spirit. Paul talked about being careful about having a root of bitterness. A root of bitterness comes from a wound to the soul. You, someone has mistreated you, you become bitter toward them. You get a divorce, you become bitter with your ex. Your kids start acting up and they don't even listen to you and you become bitter of how somebody, you know, whatever the case may be. So you can have many things that 
brings in a root of bitterness. But Paul said, if you have a root of bitterness, you must get rid of it because it will defile many. The Greek word defile in that scripture is uh, having a, a garment. It would, it, you know, you talked about, you teased this morning about not having purple grape juice because it stains the carpet. It absolutely does. So a defilement in the imagery in Greek is to take grape juice, like let's say a red grape juice, and stain a white garment with it. Well, you know, that would look pretty bad. I don't know why, I don't know why when I eat spaghetti, and I don't do it often, I, don't, I can do whatever I want, and I'm going to come out of that place with tomato sauce on my, oh, come on somebody. I mean, it don't, I, I don't care if I put five, you can put five napkins on me, and the, the tomato sauce got down to the crack where the two napkins came together. That's just how I am. It's my luck. So you, when you defile, when you are defiled, let's say, and this is a wound, by a wound that causes you to become bitter, then here's what happens. It says, and you must be careful to get that root out or it will defile many. How does it defile many? It defiles many only when you, that, and you're carrying this root, you begin to talk it to other people and you begin to pull in the people that brought the root into you or you feel offended you. You begin to talk negative about them and what happens is then people that don't even know them get an opinion about them based on what you said about them based upon what you said and your opinion can be tainted by your root. And that's why you have to be careful, what, and I've learned this the hard way, you have to be careful what people say about other people that you don't know and you've never met, because let me know, it's true, there are two sides to every story. And so you, you don't always need to give an opinion or talk because then what happens is you become defiled by somebody else's root. And you become defiled by somebody else's offense. And I want to say this because I don't want to tell the stories, but I can tell you some stories that, and this is a fact, I want you to hear me, that there is a danger of being pulled into someone else's offense. And I want to tell you what I learned. Do you remember when the spies came in and spied out the land, what did they say two of them said we could take it Joshua and Caleb had another spirit 12 and 10 of them said we can't there's giants there they're blah, 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 wild cities and and let's think about this 10 men defiled the attitude of 600,000 men of war they had to they had to wander into the wilderness for 40 years all because they took on the belief and the offense of 10 people now the Bible tells you that offenses will come the Greek word offense is scandalon and it was the part of a trap that baited the animal. But we get our word scandal from there. So offenses are going to come. There's no way you can escape it. If you have not been offended yet, get ready, you will be. Right, right. Co-worker, husband, wife, relatives, school, you know, it's going to, somebody's going to come along, do something that hurts you, that offends you. But here's the danger, and I want you to track with me for a moment. Never, ever let a person pull you. This, is, this all goes along with the wound message. I'm, I'm going to read the scriptures here. Uh, the, the offense is so dangerous because what happens, now you've got you to listen to this very carefully, that if someone becomes offended and they want to pull you in on their side in their offense, then whatever spiritual battle they are battling or whatever spirit they are battling, I promise you it will come on you. Without me talking, I'm not going to say anything about who, what, when, where, and how. But we know a woman uh, who was just scorned, and she got offended. She had this best friend, and this woman was suffering a lot physically. The other woman had no physical ailments. That woman today goes from one ailment to another to another because she let herself be pulled into the offense of this woman who had a physical problem, and then that spirit came on to her. And you'll discover that people change when they take on other other people's offenses. So here's the thing to do. I've, I mean, I've had it happen to me. I've had the opportunity of someone coming to me and said, did you hear what so-and-so said about you? And they'll tell me what so-and-so said. And I would have either the right to be offended or the right to say, you know what? The, it's like a nose. Do you know everybody has a nose? Here's my statement. Opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one. And I'll just simply say, that's his opinion. And I don't care what he says or what he thinks. That's his or her opinion. You've got to be careful because look, there's two kinds of wounds. 
There's the wound that you invited on yourself. And when you take on the defilement of somebody's root and y'all sit at a table and all you do is talk about how bad mean you are and how, they, that, how, um, how mean the people have been and how they've talked to, and you rehearse it over and over, visit the same battlefield over and over again. You visit the same battle over and over again. I've done that. I know what I'm telling you. I'm preaching to you from experience. Then what happens is it begins to become an obsession with you and you even can't even get it out of your mind. Next thing you know, you've depressed yourself talking about your problem. You depressed yourself, all right, and then you or, or you oppress yourself, and you you know your day is ruined because you just sat down and had a conversation that just ruins your whole day because it brought back all these triggers, all these memories that are negative and not positive, and they were bad memories, and you keep rehearsing the bad memories. This is going to help somebody for this night, for this morning's over. I'm telling you, okay. So it's very important that you understand not to be pulled into somebody else's offense, not to be pulled into somebody else's root of bitterness, so that lest you become defiled. Now, let's look at your own situations or what we would call your own wounds. Let me show you again. I want to say it again. The soul, intellect, will, emotions, five senses, what happens is if you allow the wound, uh, uh, let's say, uh, everybody say this, unhealed wound, if you allow an unhealed wound to continue, it will eventually move from the soul into the spirit. So now the mind is restless, oppressed, troubled, depressed, frustrated. Now soon the spirit, your spirit becomes restless. Now when your spirit gets restless, let me tell you what will happen. Been there, done that. You will not be able to sleep. You will begin to lose your appetite. The things that make you jo brought you joy in the past, Past, do not bring you joy anymore. So we got to figure out how do we get healed of a wound. If you want to go there with me for the next few minutes, put your hands together and give, a, or give the Lord a praise. Listen, it's going to be good this week, guys. It's going to be good this week. Now, the soul is mentioned, if you're keeping notes, 419 times. 419 times. Keep that in mind. So it's a very important thing. Here is what can happen to his soul. I'm going to go through these pretty fast because of the, for the sake of time this morning. Psalms 6.3, the human soul can be vexed. And that word vex, is, vex can also be oppressed. So your soul can be oppressed. Psalms, all these are in Psalms. I can just put Psalms, write the, write the number. Seven and two, the soul can be torn like a lion attacking. Just like a lion would tear flesh, your soul can be so tore up and divided. You're divided. You feel divided. You don't have any peace. Seven and five, Psalms, it can be persecuted by enemies. So when people persecute you, it doesn't just affect your mind, it affects the soul. Psalms 13, two, the soul can feel sorrow deep in the heart. It can feel. And here we go. It has emotions. It has feeling. 42 verse 5, the soul can be cast down. I'll talk about that here in just a second. 55, 18, the soul can have battles that come against it. We would call that spiritual warfare. 63, 9, the soul, uh, people can seek a person's soul to destroy it come against them to destroy it. And that's what, the, that's what, now David wrote a lot of these. 88 verse 3, the soul can be full of troubles. You didn't know your soul had that much going on, did you? You didn't realize. You just thought that was a physical thing. That's a mental thing. This is the soul. This is the life force. 107 verse 5, the soul can faint within the body. Because you talked about my soul fainted within me. So you begin to feel faint. You begin to feel weak. Psalms 143.6, the soul can become spiritually thirsty. Psalms 143 and 12, the soul can be afflicted. Oh, are y'all tracking? Say, amen, preacher. Now, let me talk for a moment for just a second about this because there's a couple little things here that are very, very, very significant. The battle begins in the mind. But if you let it continue in the mind, it starts impacting the soul or begins to impact the life force. It actually begins to, let me say it this way, it actually begins to imp impact the energy level that you have. And what will happen is you'll start feeling weak. All this stuff coming to you makes you feel, so you, get, you really drag out of bed and you'll say, honey, you'll do this for weeks. I don't know what's wrong with me. I just don't have the energy I used to have. So, you know, you go down there and buy uh, ungodly energy drinks. Now, there's one or two. <laughs> There's one or two I drink myself. Okay, I'm not, I, I do. I have to confess. But I try to stay away from the crazy stuff because it can, it can overload you too much. Okay, anybody here with me? Where's my young crowd? I know my young crowd drinks energy drinks. Come on, where are you at? I know five hours or something, right? Be careful with them, but you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Preach on. I'm going to. Here we go. 
Now, I want to show you something. I want to stop right there and talk about the soul with emotion or the soul with feeling. Have you ever thought about what I'm going to say to you? This is really true. But the Bible talks about the pleasure of sin for a season. Pleasure. Now, here's a fact. Here we go. If sin did not feel good, no one would do it. Stop and think. If, if drugs didn't release dopamine, nobody take drugs. If alcohol didn't release something, nobody drink. If you just drank alcohol and it was like a Coca-Cola, ain't nobody going to drink it. Right. Yeah. I'm really serious. So pornography is the same thing. Pornography re releases four chemicals that are the same chemicals when a person has physical relations with a woman. Just looking at it. So all of a sudden you feel good. And that listen, that's what addicts you. You get addicted to a feeling. It's going to be good if you stay with me now. Okay? Temptation, if temptation, how does, okay, let me, let me, let me, let me backtrack. How does Satan tempt you? A, tempt, a temptation is a pressure to do something you shouldn't. Simple definition. Temptation, pressure for me to do something. If you stop and think about it, every temptation, that is a temptation that the Bible would warn us against is a temptation geared toward the enemy showing you how you will feel when you do what he says. Jesus was hungry. Command these stones to be made bread, Satan said, so that Jesus could sense he was already hungry, but what would it be like to have a good meal? He's testing him on feeling. All of your testing, all of it, is based on one thing, how you will feel if you follow through with what you're thinking. If temptation did not affect your feeling good, if you thought you did it, you would never yield to it. That's why good of good, I'm about to, mm -hmm. I, look, I'm staying calm on Sunday morning. From here on out, it's Perry Stone Unleashed, okay? So you just, you just need to get used to it. It's about to get crazy around here. And here's, here's the thing that is so, it's so true and it's so real. A person gets addicted to alcohol or to drugs, even pornography. Why? Tell me why. It's all about the feeling. Here's the great thing about God. Mm. The Holy Spirit can be felt. The power of God can be felt. The anointing can be felt. The Word of God does something called quickening. That Greek word means makes alive. The Holy Ghost quickens your mortal body. The Holy Spirit quickens your mortal body. The Word of God is quick. That means alive, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. See, the reason some churches are so empty and lifeless and dry, if they don't believe in the anointing and the Holy Spirit, Spirit, then you got people sitting in there, watch this, who still come in and they leave the same. They come in with the confession of their mouth. They know Jesus, but you watch them. They have the same bondage on Friday down at the same bar getting drunk on Saturday, coming in church on Sunday. And the problem is that that church is so dead, it has no feeling to replace the feeling that Satan is giving to people. But when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, there's a feeling that'll come on you. You're going to have the high of the most high. God Almighty, you're going to have the high from the Most High. I never will forget, this happened on two different occasions, two different occasions. These two men are giving me their testimonies. It was in Alabama, by the way, state of Alabama. And both of them had been heavy cocaine addicts. They were now completely delivered. And both of them tell me their testimony. They didn't know each other. They say the same thing. They said, here's what was so weird. They said, I've been taking cocaine most of my life. So I go to this church. And I go down the altar and get saved. He said, I felt a weight come off of me. He said, I'm not telling you I felt the, the Holy Ghost. I felt a weight come off of me when I asked Jesus. I said, well, that's a good start. Praise God. He said, but when I got to baptism of the Holy Ghost, two men told me this. They said, let me tell you what it felt like the first hit I ever had of cocaine. I said, whoa, whoa. I said, I said that again. He said, no. When I first, took, he said, the problem with cocaine is when you take it, you never get higher than the first high. Right. Am, anybody been on it? 
You never get higher than the first high, so then you try to take more to get up there, and that, then you become a real addict, and you got to have it all the time. He said, but I'm telling you, when the Holy Ghost came on me and I started speaking in tongues, he said, the power of God starts shaking my body, and he said, I laid on the floor and got up. I said, man, this is better than cocaine. And I said, you know what he said? He said, the Holy Ghost is God's dope. Yeah. The point I want to make to you is this. God understands that your body, soul, and spirit, but you are also emotion. You are one-third. A psychiatrist told me this, a psychologist. He said, you are one-third rational thinking and two-thirds emotion. Now think about that for just a moment. One-third being able to rationalize, but most of your life, two-thirds of it will be acting on how you feel, acting on your emotion, making a choice based on how you feel about it. You want to go here? No, I just don't feel. How many times you said it in a day? I just don't feel like I want to do that. You want to get up? No, I don't feel like I want to do that. When you go to breakfast? No, I don't feel like I want to do that. Your, your favorite word all day is feel. You coming to church? I just don't feel like coming to church. Feel, 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 feel. So you're two-thirds emotion. You're making your choices on how you feel. But I want you to understand, as I get into what David said about getting healed of a, of a wound, I want you to understand this soul and spirit connection. I want you to understand how, how, how Satan pushes emotion and feeling, and that's how he gets into your body. That's how he gets into your life. You take on an offense. You take on a bitterness. You get really and it's a true hurt. It's not some fake thing. It's not in your head. You get real hurt by somebody, and all of a sudden that, that hurt cuts. And as, as if you don't get it healed and deal with it very, very shortly, very shortly deal with it and try to get over it, I'm telling you, that thing will fester, and it, come, it becomes a word that Paul used called a stronghold. Once it's a stronghold, you don't let, now, now watch, you don't let anybody in your life because now you don't trust anybody. So you build a wall. I'm not letting nobody in. They're going to hurt me. I can't stand to be hurt again. I'm not, you know, I'm never going to get married again. I'm never going to, I'm never going to build a relationship because who knows what's going to happen. So you get, you get no trust. Your trust is gone. You build a stronghold. But what's bad is you're inside that stronghold not letting yourself out. You've got yourself in a mental prison. You've actually locked yourself in a mental prison. And so now you're not letting anybody in. And here's the problem. There are probably some people that could absolutely help you in your situation. But if you put the stronghold up, you're not letting the very people in that could help you, including people in the church. That's good preaching, Perry. Okay, thank you, Perry. Amen, amen, amen. So... So you didn't have to clap. I just cutting up with you. So here's what David said. David has Saul chasing him. Dave, look, David had all kinds of problems. Can I give you something? Can I, can I give you something real quick? I did this on my YouTube channel, and I think I offended some people. I never pulled the video off because I thought it was funny. I did it to be funny. And it had a statue of David, and it said this. Was King David a narcissist? Now, look, see, that's the response I got right there. That's exactly, that's the response I got out of YouTube right there. Like, what is he saying? Now, I want to talk to you about David because I have, uh, I have had counseling sessions. I've canceled, I've read books. I know psychology, and I know what a narcissist is. Now, watch David. Watch David. He's done bad. He's done wrong. Everybody, everybody in the whole nation knows it. And he, oh, God, oh, God, I cry out to you. Oh, God, I repent. You alone, Lord, can help. He's repenting. This. Oh, you see, you feel sorry for the guy. Look at the poor guy. Man, he's laid. He's out. He just laid out on a carpet before God. Next chapter. Lord, I want to ask you, how long are you going to let these people talk bad about me after I've repented? I have repented. I've come clean. But they're still harassing me. They're still, they are still harassing me. So you see, he's a little bit upset because he feels like I've done the right thing, but nobody sees me doing the right thing. They still want to go back to what I did wrong. Hello, somebody. They always want to bring up when you did wrong. Hey, they don't like you. They're mad at you. You made them mad. So now they're going to talk about you bad the rest of your life. Just get used to it. <laughs> so then he goes to the next chapter and he says, God, I'm going to ask you to do something. Make those make that man kill him to where his kids are orphans. He says it in the Bible. No, I'm not, am I not, am, you know, do y'all know I'm not making this up? Then the next a two cha couple chapters later, he says, let them all go to hell. <laughs> Sheol, he uses the word Sheol. Take them down to Sheol. And then he, next chapter, oh God, I am sorry. 
Oh, God, I repent. Oh, come on. We call it cycles of repentance, and many of you have been there too. Hello. I'm going to preach to you whether you want to hear it or not. Sometimes you need a cycle of repentance. If you if y'all hearing this and you're receiving it, clap your hands just so I know. I, I just want to know. Okay, still here? So here's what he says, and I'm going to give you something here that's pretty interesting. Why are you cast down my soul? Why are you disquieted? So now he's, all, he's been through all this mess, but now what's happened, his soul is what? Cast down. What does that mean? What's it mean that his soul is disquieted? The Hebrew means loud sounds to distract you. So David's saying, this is what David's saying. You've been there. Okay, I've prayed, I've repented, I'm full of the Holy Ghost, I'm a member of the church. I'm trying to do everything right. So if I'm trying to do everything right, how come I'm still getting distracted by my past? How come I sit in church and still remember? How come I sit in church and it comes back up? How come? So he's disquieted by what he's been through. And he said, why is my soul so disquieted? I'm trusting in you, God. Am I talking to anybody here? I'm trusting in you. But I still have this really uneasiness in my spirit after all this mess is over. Now, here's what he says. Why are you cast down? I begin to read. In fact, I have a Bible, and I apologize for not bringing these. They are so heavy to ship to Alaska. But you can order one off of the Internet. I did a whole, my Old Testament commentary. The Old Testament's that thick. The New Testament's that thick. We couldn't even put them in one Bible. But I did a little, a little study on cast down, all right? And cast down... It's very interesting because he says in this phrase, he says, I am cast down. It is a sheep metaphor. And here's what happens. A, a, a sheep gets a lot of wool on it. It hasn't been sheared. It's out with the other sheep and it kind of it strays away a little bit. Then it, it falls and it happens to roll on its back. Now, now, sheep don't have hands like we do and elbows to pull themselves up. So if a sheep falls on its back, it requires the shepherd to come and to rub its leg, pick it up and it's rub its legs to get the blood circulating back in the legs because if it lays on its back, all the blood goes to what's called the, the rudum or the, or the belly area. If a shepherd does not show up in time, this is the truth, gases will build up inside the sheep and it will die over a period of time. And I'm not talking five or 10 minutes here. It would have to be a couple hours. So to be cast down, David was using a sheep metaphor saying, I have rolled over on my back and I can't get back up. I, God, I'm doing everything I can to stand in this thing. But the reason I'm having a hard time getting ba back up is I'm being disquieted by things I'm hearing. Okay? You can have this in a job where they say to a factory, well, you know, we might be closing down in a year. And then you never hear much, and then a month later, what about that closing down? Well, I haven't heard anything. You know what it does? It disquiets your spirit. Because what are you going to do? Should you go ahead and plan now for a change? Should you go ahead and look for another job? Do you want to stay with the company? Are they or are they not? That's an example of being disquieted where the information you're hearing is noise to distract you. Wow. And this is what David's talking about. He's talking about being distracted by the noise. Now, a cast down can be, a, I wrote this down, a sudden job loss, unexpected death of a family member, a storm. I saw pictures of the storm y'all went through here with the ice on the building. And I turned to my wife and I said, that is so not normal that he's hit the prince spirit of Alaska. Whoever the, no, I said, whoever the prince demon is hates this church and don't want it built. Ha! I got news for you. Too bad. So sad. We're in it today. Oh, oh, oh. Hallelujah. Oh, 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 oh. Jesus. I'm going to grab his arm and square dance with him, Tennessee style, in a minute if the Holy Ghost keeps coming on me. <laughs> but here's the thing. What that does, those things knock you off your feet temporarily. And that's what, that, that's what it means to be cast down. Then he says this. This one gets real heavy. Psalms 49, four, I'm sorry, 41 and 9. My unfamiliar friend whom I trusted, which did eat my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. He even talks about this friend, we don't know who it was by name, that even went to the house of God and they fellowshiped in the house of God. And he said, this is somebody that we fellowship. We would go eat, you know, we would say it this way. After church, we'd always go out and eat with this family. We'd always go out and eat with this couple. We had great fellowship. We, were, we came to church together. He said, but this friend 
<laughs> has lifted up his heel against me. Again, it's a metaphor, but it's a metaphor known in that day. To lift up the heel against the person represented a horse. This, this, is, this, was the Hebrew, this is how the Hebrew metaphor is interpreted. A horse that a man who owns it is feeding. A trusted horse that he rides, he saddles up. They've been in war together. You know, this is his buddy, his horse. He's, he's, and he gets behind the horse and the horse just kicks him. Kicks him and hurts him, hits him in the chest. Donkeys have done that. Knocks him back. And that is called what David alluded to there. He lifted up his heel. So here's what he's saying. I had a friend. We sat down together in God's house. We sat together and ate meals. And all of a sudden, because of what I went through, my friend turned on me and lifted up his heel and kicked me to wound me. Is this too deep? It's amazing, isn't it? You see, you read these verses, but you don't always know the background of it. All right? And then, and then what was amazing, this same friend, and I just did a study on this, and I did not know any of this until I started studying it out in detail. But this same friend pastor would go to David's house, and he was playing both sides. And he would go, because David talks about this friend who would go out, and then the friend would say, David, <laughs> so funny, I just want you to know that I really do love you. I know what you've been through, David, but you need to know I'm, I'm there for you. And then the friend would leave the palace and say to other people, when will he perish? Wow. When will his name be removed from the earth? I, I, can't, I can't handle people who have had a bad past and did really bad things, including killing people when they were drug dealers, who then after they have been forgiven, can't forgive somebody else. Right? Worst thing in the world is for you to be a person that God has forgiven of much, and you won't even forgive a little. It's a sin, and it's very, very dangerous. Okay, everybody still here say, yes, I am, preacher. Yes, I am, preacher. Okay, now, we could go into all these little metaphors, but let's get to what I think is the most uh, the, 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 the best part of this message is how does God restore? Now, first of all, I want you to understand two things. The first thing I want you to understand is what Jesus carried to the cross. Because in Isaiah chapter 53, we know that he was wounded for our transgressions uh, and bruised for our iniquities. That's Isaiah 53, 5 and 7. We know that by his stripes we are healed. That's verse 5 of Isaiah 53. That's physical healing. But check this one. This is the soul. I talked to you just a minute ago. I mentioned the spirit. I mentioned the body. He carried our sorrow, grief. Uh, he was oppressed. He was afflicted. And God saw the travail of his soul. Isaiah 53, verse 4, 7, and 10. Now, do you understand? Sorrow, grief, oppression, affliction is emotionally connected. When you feel sorrow, you feel it in your emotions. If you feel grief at a funeral, you feel it in your emotions. Oppression is a feeling that you can sense. Uh, uh, afflictions that come to you, you feel those. So here's, here's the thing. Now, get this. Jesus bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, Matthew uh, 8, 17. But what that means is that Jesus actually carried, this is so neat, your sorrow. He carried your grief. He carried your oppression. He carried your fear. Every emotion of the soul that Satan could use to attack you in that emotion, Jesus took it. Think about this. Literally, literally, according to the Bible, he that knew no sin became sin that we would be made the righteousness of God. So when he's carrying that cross up the hill, he's got your oppression on him. He's got your fear on him. He's got your anxiety on him. He's got any grief you'll ever experience about a death in the future on him. So it hit me one day. I'm telling you, it hit me. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. My God. Oh, Jesus. This is for somebody. It hit me. I had been carrying things that I thought I'm supposed to carry. I'm supposed to be sad. I'm supposed to be sorrowful. I'm supposed to be hurt. I'm supposed to be hurt. I was hurt. I'm supposed to be hurt because I was hurt. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, why are you carrying what I took? Oh my God. Oh my God. He said, You've allowed the, this is for someone here. You've allowed the enemy to put this on you. you. You've just kind of accepted it. Like, you know, that my mama was a depressed person. So, you know, 
I fight the same thing, and they tell me my grandmother was a little bit of this, and just like the older I get, it's coming. I mean, here's what's happening. You're accepting what Jesus took off of you. No, it came to me. I'm telling you, I start getting delivered from myself. Right. <laughs> David had to get delivered from himself. You know what he said? I will say to my soul, I will make my boast in the Lord. David had to talk to his soul because when you speak out loud, then what is in the spirit that's invisible, which is your soul and spirit that lives in your body, words release activity in the spirit world. It's not your thinking that gets you free. It's not you sitting around thinking, well, maybe God's going to help me. You open, you keep your mouth shut. It's when you open up your mouth and you come into an agreement with Isaiah 53 and say, my Lord, what in the world am I carrying that mess for when Jesus told me he already he took it and nailed it to the cross. I feel the Holy Spirit in this place. Woo! Oh, my Lord. So he says, he restoreth my soul. In Hebrew, it's the word shuv. And we're coming into a season in August called Teshuvah. You, if you've heard my messages, you've heard me teach on that on YouTube or on my messages. And really... <laughs> <laughs> that word shuv means to turn, and it actually can, it, it actually, in some connotations, it can mean this. In the, if you're talking about attack, and you're, and you're using that word, not teshuvah the season, but if you're using that word, it can mean, I quote in Hebrew, to make things as they were before the attack came. Let me, come on, Selah, and drop the mic. Right. Make things as they were before the attack came. And this is the reason why in Joel, Joel, Joel God says, I will restore to you the years that the canker worm and the caterpillar have eaten. Four, four different types of insects that devoured you to the root and nobody thought you'd get it back. And God said, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to put a shoe on you. I'm putting a move. God got, you got to move. God's got a shoe. Come on. Make a t-shirt of that. You got to move. God's got a shoe. Somebody ask you what it is. It says it means God's going to bring back what the, some of you that have suffered for years. There will come a moment if we can believe God in this meeting that God's going to deliver you after years of what you've had to go through. Hallelujah. And you're going to be able to say, he made me brand new. Hallelujah. And then I got one more word for you. I will restore the years that the enemy has taken. Now, this is really interesting, and I want to close with this. That most, there's a word which is mentioned in the Hebrew that all of you have probably said at one time. Has anybody ever heard the word shalom? Yeah. If you've heard the word shalom, raise your hand. I just want to see how many. Okay, do you all know what it means? It does not just mean peace. That was, the, that was kind of the English translation of how people said shalom means peace. Shalom means everything. Now, in the morning in Israel, shalom, shalom, uh, Shabbat on Friday at 6 o'clock. Shabbat, shalom, happy. And that doesn't mean, it, it, it means have a, okay, can mean have a blessed time, have a successful time, God be with you, God's favor. I mean, when you say shalom, it is a broad word when you, when you look at the context of places it can be used. Now, you ready for this? When, when Joel said, God is going to restore he uses a word that if you're not careful, you'll think it looks like shalom. It is not. It's called shalom. And it's there. It's there in the Hebrew. It's the way. Now remember, the Hebrew didn't have the vowels in it. But it's, it, it has the root of shalom, but it's shalom. And you know what shalom means? You ready? You're going to love this now. It means to make an end to the thing. To make recompense and get a payback, to make amends. Basically, he says, when the time comes and this great move of God comes, God is going to start shalaming people. He's going to give them the payback that the enemy tried to steal from them. <laughs> He's going to make an end to the attack that they're under. 
And he's going to allow them to make amends. Now, the whole Bible, whether you know this or not, is a book of restoration. Samson lost it, but was restored. David lost it, but was restored. Peter denied the Lord, but he was restored. And so you got to understand what David said. Watch this. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. When your soul has been restored, you can lay down in green pastures. And what on earth does that mean? Ready? You can rest. I'm going to conclude by telling you this. You're not healed totally. You may be on your journey. You may be on your way. But you're not healed totally if you rest at night and these things keep coming up bothering you. Well, it can be your past. It could be what people have said. I mean, I could list a whole list. You're not totally, you're there. You're on your way. You're believing God. But I'm going to tell you how you know. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how you know. It's like somebody comes in, they're after you, and you go, oh, tell me in the morning after I lay down and have a good nice rest. When it does, listen, when the person you see doesn't hurt you anymore, you can look at him and it doesn't sting. When you can think about, about it and it's so far gone, you don't even want to think about it. When the pain of it has finally lifted, that's how you know you're at rest. Now, can we move this? Because I want to do an altar call if I can. And, I, you know, I've got more time, but I think, I think I've preached everything the Holy Spirit would give me. Thank you, sir. If you have, if you feel like we're going to start something today for you by the Spirit of God, God's going to start it, not me. If you feel like that you have a wound of any kind that you have experienced that you're not totally healed of, and you heard this message, and you say, oh, my, Perry, man, I needed that. That's what I need to get me to the next level. Come on up here right now. Just, if you would, just kind of line up so, shoulder to shoulder, side by side, all the way across the front. Okay? There you go. Uh, and, and prayer team, if you want to come, we're going to pray a general prayer uh, because of Sunday. Now, listen, tonight it's unleashed. It's unleashed all week. 12 to, 12 to 1 on, on the weekdays. You don't want to miss those, please. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Did it hit you? Oh, help her. The power of God's coming on. Dear Lord, the anointing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. Oh, my God. Look at this, Pastor. See, the Lord knew. The Lord knew this had to be preached this morning. Not, not tomorrow. Not tomorrow night. Now, uh, let me just say, and I don't tell my story. A few people know it. But I've been through things that people, whether, well, some did it purposely. Some, some I don't know, whatever the problem was. But I've been wounded. I told somebody, I said, if I took my jacket off and showed you my back, you'd be shocked how many knives have been in there. <laughs> Guess what, though? I survived. I'm a survivor. I've been surviving for 47 years of preaching. All kinds of craziness. And I'm still in the race, and I'm still preaching the gospel. You know why? Because when God puts something in your life, the enemy can't take the call from you and the anointing. He, he doesn't control that. Come on, somebody. So I'm, I'm, the reason I say that is I, I've been there. So when I, when I preach wounds, I'm preaching out of my soul, spirit, out of my soul. What I want you to do is raise your hands. I want you to repeat a prayer after me, and I want you to pray it out loud. I want you to mean it from your heart. And this is a prayer that we're going to start, ask God to begin something today, this morning, when you walk out this door. And I want you to say this out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. I believe your word. I believe it is your will to completely heal me in my soul and in my spirit. And I'm asking you now, whatever residue that's in me that I'm holding on to that I can't get rid of, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to take this from me. You carried this. You want me to have victory. You want me to rest. You want me to have peace. So I'm asking you in Jesus' name, begin today to completely, totally free my soul and stitch up those wounds. I'm asking you, Lord, you said in your word through David that you heal the broken of heart and you bind up their wounds. 
This message was for me, Lord, and I receive it now that you want to restore and you want to heal me. So I'm going to walk in it. You're going to teach me how. In Jesus' name. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast and it's enriched you and helped you in your life. If you've never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you do it now? Pray this prayer with me right out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place. Thank you that he rose again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all of my sin. Wash me, cleanse me, and make me new. Thank you for loving me, and thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Let me pray for you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch each and every person that prayed that prayer out of sincerity of heart. I pray a breaking off of every assignment of darkness, any chain, any bondage, any habit that's not of God, that you would sever it and set them free. I pray and ask, Holy Spirit, touch them and fill them now and use them for your purpose and give them a hunger for your word and for the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, text us, would you, so that we can help you grow in the things of God. Text SAVED to the number 907-357-2065. If you don't have a home church, we hope that you would find a home with us here at Kings, Alaska. If you're in some other part of the nation or the world, find a good local church that preaches and teaches God's word and grow in the things of God. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you in future broadcasts or in services. Praise the Lord.